I'd like to welcome everyone this afternoon to a sisterhood webinar on Bakelite and a variety of buttons and other interesting things. Uh, after one of our recent sisterhood webinars, Susie Cohen contacted me and shared her interest and love of buttons and all things Bakelite and generously offered to share her expertise and knowledge with us. Um, Susie's background is in fashion design and uh, a variety of needle and fiber crafts, including quilting. Uh, but her love of buttons, I think, surpasses all but perhaps her love for her husband, Rick. So Susie, Share with us, please. Okay, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Hello, everyone. Everyone, it's nice to see you. I'm going to do a real quick screen share. Share screen. Host disabled participating screen share. Okay, can you fix that? Yes, I can. Okay. I am so sorry. That's okay. You are now okay, okay. Let me try it again. I apologize okay um I'm this is my friend Sally Shecklow she was my friend in buttons perhaps some of you remember her Sally and I would meet together um many times even when I lived in Roseburg we'd meet together and we would trade buttons. We wouldn't sell buttons to each other, but we would trade buttons. She liked plastic colorful buttons for her crafting art. And I like the uh, more collectible antique buttons. And um, she was my button friend and I dearly miss her. Um, as Phyllis said, I have been collecting uh, and studying and presenting and competing with buttons for over 15 years. I'm a member of the National Button Society, the Oregon State Button Society, and the Eugene Button Club. I promise not to try to convert you into button collectors. That's not my goal. I would like to share one of my passions and introduce you to a beautiful material, Bakelite, in a lighthearted and informal way. I'm not proclaiming to be an expert on Bakelite. Please note that celluloid was both organic and inorganic and highly flammable. And it was invented in 1869. Bakelite was invented in 1907. Therefore, Bakelite was the first totally synthetic plastic that came along 30, 38 years after celluloid. If you need more information on compression molding, also known, known as Bakelite, compression molding, also known as Bakelite phenolic resin, uh, YouTube does have a video on that. Um, I was going to ask everyone to turn off their video, but because it's a small group, you can leave your audio on. Please make note of any slide that you have in question, and I'll try to answer your questions at the end. It doesn't really make sense to answer questions during the pre presentation because the question, the, the answer may come up during the presentation. <laughs> so um, now, my friends, I'd like you to come along with me and reminisce. So has everybody seen the screen? Yes. Okay, great. Aren't these lovely 
Look how they seem to twirl their skirts and what appears to look like gold dust. Bakelite collectors call this stardust. If you have one, you are certain you certainly struck it rich. Uh, as a side note, at the time I created this presentation, I did not have that button, but I do now. So I'm happy about that. Wow. <laughs> For those of us who weren't around during the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl of, of the Great Plains, here is the insight into the, the lives of our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, what they endured during the 1930s. Folks lost their homes, their finances, their jobs, but they had each other. There was a diversion towards inexpensive fashion accessories. Bakelite buttons became a whimsical, became whimsical in the era of depression and wartime. They drew attention away from somber garments. In 1937, 5.5 million pounds of Bakelite was produced within, with almost half of it used in the manufacture of buttons. During World War II, button manufacturing increased in America. Bakelite, a trademark of phenolic formaldehyde resin was invented in 1907 by Belgian born American chemist, Dr. Leo Hendrik Bakeland. Leo was born in 1863 in Ghent, Belgium. He invented Velox, it's a pho photographic paper. He died in 1944 at the age of 80 in Beacon, New York. At the time of his death, it is estimated that there were 15,000 different products. Bakelite is hard, infusible, and chemically resistant plastic. It may this made it a, the first truly synthetic resin. It marked the beginning of the plastics industry. Bakelite, based on a chemical combination of phenol and formaldehyde, two compounds that were diverted from coal tar and wood alcohol, the colors were dark and drab because they were filled with wood flour. In 1930 to 1940, the buttons were compressed, compression molded and carved from blocks. Rods were formed and sheets were dye pressed into novelty shapes. Now this is the uh, machine that was used during the early operation and it was the, called the Bakelizer. And this is the cherry button falling. Here's a chocolate button falling and a green pea button falling. And that's just my humor. Actually, they didn't come off the production line like that. But I have a, a strange sense of humor. Bakelite is the material of a thousand uses the world's first inexpensive man-made substance. It is chemically inert, meaning inactive. It does not bloom nor emit acid sulfur compounds as does hard rubber, eliminating troubles from surface leakage and it is impervious to moisture, oil and solvents. It's permanent in color and is easily machined and engraved. How many of you out there remember the rotary phones? That one there? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I even remember my own old phone number. Yeah, me too. <laughs> the heyday of Bakelite was considered between 1933 and 1941. These were the years of the Great Depression that led up to World War II. When World War II began, the unique property 
of Bakelite made it an invaluable material in defense. And I want you to note the logo. It's a trefoil shape. It has B for Bakelite. It has the infinity sign in there. I guess I have to un unzoom to go forward. <laughs> Advertising examples. On the left are some industrial applications. And if, uh, I'll zoom in on the, uh, a few of these things for you, if my mouse will cooperate. Notice the uh, laminated block used for table service. And the green water repellent raincoat. I first looked at that, I look, uh, it looked like a, a house coat, but they call it a raincoat. And uh, there's a few other industrial applications. Paint, looks like something's grinding there. I can't actually read it, it's too tiny. Notice the camera housing, the fan, which looks very art deco, handles for small appliances, the fishing reel. There's also, uh, did I say the clock already? And this is just a box, a trinket box. How many of you remember handles on, on appliances at home? Remember what? Uh, handles and knobs on kitchen appliances. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Comes to mind is um, waffle iron my parents had. <laughs> I remember some salad tongs. Oh. Catalan is the brand name for thermoset polymer that was popular from the 1930s through the 1960s. It was developed and trademarked in 1927 by the American Catalan Corporation when the company acquired the patents for Bakelite. Catalan is produced by a different two-stage process of, than other types of phenolic resins. It does not contain fillers. It is transparent and near colorless, unlike other phenolics, and it can be produced in bright and vibrant colors or even marbled. In fact, Catalan became more popular than other types of Bakelite for the consumer products. I just love those bangles there. Here's some Catalan um, color samples that I pulled up off the internet. Here's an original store card of buckles, of a buckle. And I, as a button collector, I've come to realize that sometimes during the 1930s and 40s, um, buttons would be sold with the buckles as a set. And sometimes you'd even get a little card with the thread that matches included. Right. How to identify. Learn the feel, the, the smell, the sound, and the look of authentic Bakelite. Some tests can be done while shopping at thrift stores and flea markets. Do, do not test with a hot needle. I've got uh, a couple Bakelite buttons here, and I'm going to clang them together, and I want you to listen. Can you guys hear that? Yes. Mm -hmm. OK, so that sound is very distinct. Um, Bakelite is heavy and weighty. If you were to take a likewise, uh, an equal object and hold it, same size, shape, and Bakelite in the other hand, Bakelite would definitely be heavier. Smell, rub, 
formaldehyde or hot water. The hot water, I would take caution, particularly as a button collector, if you have a metal shank, you don't want to do that. Um, I use mostly these little pads on the lower right. They're so similar to Simichrome. Simichrome is actually pink. You put it on a Q-tip and you rub it just a little bit on the Bakelite and it'll turn yellow if positive. And the little uh, test strips do the same thing. Um, they do not harm the object of Bakelite at all. In fact, they're both made to polish. Um, at the very end of this presentation, I will tell you where you can buy those little pads. When I put down there that not always semichrome, black is a very hard color to test. So just wanted you to keep that in mind. Can Bakelite stain? Yes. Can Bakelite craze? Yes, it can. Crazing is like little tiny cracks, little fractures. If, if they're not stored or kept in good conditions, they can stain or craze. I made this little color block myself um, just to show the variety of colors Bakelite comes in. The rarest one, scarce, would be the aqua teal. You're going to pay more for aqua teal. Um, Bakelite can be transparent, um, opaque, or translucent. Not all these objects are buttons. There's dress clip, which would probably be the olive green one. Um, there is a bangle, which would be the teal one. If you notice that the color are usually associated with fruit, vegetables, and candy. When you look, if you're a Bakelite person, you usually say, oh, that's apple juice Bakelite, or oh, that's butterscotch Bakelite, or um, tortoiseshell Bakelite. You always say the color before the actual object, the name. Um, it's just something that Bakelite collectors do. The ones in the square on the top are actually my collection. And they look black to the naked eye, except for the giraffe. This is called oxidation. The giraffe hasn't quite oxidated as the other ones have. And when you hold these black buttons up to a bright light, surprise, surprise, they're teal. It was very difficult to photograph these, so I had to use a little hemostat. Um, I want to bring your attention to uh, the co conical shaped button in the center and the one that is waffle looking, it's kind of a square. Those two reveal, those two buttons actually reveal two colors, purple and teal sort of mixed together, which reminded me of a glass called saffron glass. This type of Bakelite is called Pristal. It was made by the American Catlin Corporation. It's a bot, it was known for its bicolor quality. My friend Jocelyn Howell said these, these changed colors on the outside because the natural color phenolic battled with the dyed color. Phenolic color of orange controlled and came out to the surface changing the outside color. On these thin pieces, you can see the original color when held to the light. If one was to polish off the oxidation away, you would see the original color again for a while and then the oxidation process would have time to act again. So just for fun, I know you, you folks are not button collectors, but just for fun, 
the assignment is to take your black buttons or black objects and hold them up to a bright light. And you might be surprised that they might be actually teal. And someone said to me, oh, Susie, those aren't teal, those are green. Well, I photographed my green Bakelite just so that you could see that these are definitely teal. And those are green on the left, lower left. Beautiful. Now, how many of you know the word schmutz? <laughs> of course. Absolutely. <laughs> you all know schmutz. My mother taught me that one. Well, this uh, brooch definitely has schmutz and it drives me crazy. Um, if that brooch was mine, I'd get a Q-tip out and clean them up. Because I think, I think that brooch is adorable. Um, the seller said it looked black to the naked eye, but under a bright light, it was dark purple. And I also have some Bakelite that are purple. <laughs> Do you have to worry about any particular cleaning materials? Um, I just, me, I just use a little water, um, maybe a slight bit of um, detergent to get the schmutz off. Um, you could use Dawn, you know, just clean it off. I wouldn't get anything wet that had metal on it because then you'd have rust. Okay. Butterscotch and pea green are the most popular. Generally the least expensive colors, although each piece must be evaluated individually for rarity and desirability when determining value. Some collectors focus on marbled pieces. Marbled Bakelite items incorporate more than one color, swirled together, and they are easy to find. Mm, I don't know about that. <laughs> Here's some other useful products. I have an unusual breaking knife with a heavy Bakelite handle. It was my mother's. Um, now I can't find it to show you, <laughs> but uh, it was, my mother used it for um, pound cake, not pound cake, uh, angel food cake and uh, sponge cake. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you ever saw it. It looks like it has pr long prongs. Right. And uh, other game pieces include dominoes and mahjong. Huh. I love that radio. Ah, oh, romance. She has an antebellum dress and is holding a nosegay or fan. He is offering his hand with a hat behind him. What a gentleman and a perfect setting for a meal, a romantic meal by candlelight. I'm not certain how these two colors were assembled. Perhaps like cane work or a cookie technique, making this motif two-sided. I'm going to focus in on it. Do you see how it goes all the way through? Mm -hmm. And it would probably be a uh, two-sided. The dress in the upper left corner reflects the same antebellum period. The bows are very pop bows are a very popular color, mauvine, which was an aniline dye. Very colorful streamline and art deco. In the 1930s, radios were king. This is pop, this is prior to television. More than 40% of all American households owned a radio. A decade later, that number doubled. More, more than doubled to 83, 83%. Now, isn't that a fun table setting? Love it. Yeah. And I love that radio on the top. Well, both radios are beautiful. They're very streamlined. Love it. Mm -hmm. 
Bengals worn in sets of three to five or seven with thin spacers. Notice the deeply carved ones on the left. A fashionable lady could coordinate colors with her outfit. The bangles made a clank, clank sound as they fell from the forearm to the wrist. My favorites are the deeply carved tropical butterscotch um, one. It almost looks like a plumeria, looks tropical. Mm -hmm. And the one with the inlaid mother pearl at the top. And I also like above that, the one with the serpentine motif. So the, the lady with her arm is not actually wearing them properly. She should have spacers in between. But I think this is a model just trying to sell her fake light bangles. Apple juice. We're going to get into some of these colors. So apple juice is transparent, but this particular button on the left has been painted on the back. It's been carved on the back and painted on the back, very much like Lucite. And the buttons on the upper right, they almost look like they're floating there. They're visually suspended, and I found matching bangles. Wow. <laughs> I did. Wow. Did that take your breath away? <gasps> I recently added him in. He's a zipper pull and he's rare. This is dark brown Bakelite. He looks like an early American soldier with a tricorn hat. He is carved. He is pierced. Pierced meaning like uh, between his legs that is an opening and uh, where his arms are, are openings. He's hand painted with white and red details. The length of this figure is one and seven eighths. And the total length of the zipper pull is two and a half inches. Apple juice Bakelite. I want you to um, take note of the sheen uh, on the back of this apple juice. It's very distinctive. And there's schmutz on the, the squares. <laughs> if that was my button, you know I'd get the Q-tip out. <laughs> okay, tortoise shell Bakelite. I think that sea turtle on the upper right is my favorite, most beautiful button. It's not mine, but I saw it on the internet and I think it's really lovely, all the carving that goes into it. Right below it is a triad shape. It's chunky and I managed to buy that one. It adds fire to my soul. It's just lovely. And uh, let's take a look at the ones on the upper left. I'm gonna zoom in on it. Okay, those little tiny speckles that you see are not glitter. Uh, that's called coralline. They're little tiny glass balls and they're very fragile. They fall out very easily. And there's also little metal insets in there too. They're also very fragile. So one has to take great care with those type of uh, buttons. Oh, I have to unzoom to, to go forward. Pure in color, there's no intermixing with root beer. The hand is either giving approval or needs a hitchhike to the nearest A&W for a refill. Do you guys actually see my notes? No. Oh, good. <laughs> no. It's a lovely presentation. Uh, thank you. I'm trying. I, I add humor to every presentation I do. On the left, 
and the center are two inset buttons. Also notice the, the trefoil shape in the upper right is a quadrifoil and that one's laminated. When we do competitions with buttons, if we're doing a Bakelite competition, you have to represent multiple colors on one button. So this is why they are very sought after by collectors. A few more inter, I mean, multicolored um, Bakelite. The top butterscotch Bakelite features inlays, meaning that they are actually, those colors are flush with the surface. The chocolate brown button on the bottom there on to the left has mechanical dangles that are attached with tin. And over the years, I guess it's caused a few scratches on the surface. It probably could be polished out a bit and restored with a polishing cloth. And if you wore this button on your jacket or coat, it implies that you're a very fun person. There are studio artists today that still make uh, buttons out of <clears throat> Bakelite. Um, Brad Elf Frank of Elfin Craft Studios is quite the artist. Rick and I, my husband, we have one of his buttons. It's a little dragon. And on the left is a artwork done by Gary Harbour. I have one of his buttons. Um, the center part is actually Formica and he, he etches into the Formica just like a scrim, scrimshaw technique and then dyes it. And then I guess he um, in, inlays it in a Bakelite uh, frame. Here's an example of a technique called carved, deeply carved butterscotch flower. Notice how the color goes all the way through the material, unlike celluloid when carved. If this was celluloid, you'd see the cream color of celluloid below the surface. Um, I think the flower has oxidation, which adds to its beauty and depth. Um, the one on the left, licorice bakelite, and I think it's like butterscotch maybe. And it's got a little schmutz. <laughs> I won't let that bother me. <laughs> Icebox cookies, what? Growing up, my mother was queen of her kitchen. And when mom was preparing meals, we kids knew to stay out. Therefore, she never taught me to cook. The one exception is, my mother said, a Jewish wife needs to know how to properly clean a chicken. So she taught me how to do that. And she also taught me how to make cookies. My mother was always clipping recipes from Good Housekeeping Magazine, Ladies Home Journal, and McCall's. And I'm sure these icebox cookies were published in all of them. Wow. Notice how you need two flavors to bake these cookies. The dough is rolled out and layered with the opposing dough, depending on the desired configuration. The dough is either rolled or cut. Quilters call it this kind of technique stack and whack. <laughs> some techniques were simple and some were more complex. When the dough was formed, in, then the dough was formed into a log and wax paper held the log a long log together, and it was hardened in the refrigerator for several hours. When removed, the dough was sliced with a sharp knife and ready for the oven. Do any of you remember these cookies? Sure. I do, and I bake, but I don't, I never learned how to do that. They're nice. Yeah. Delicious cookie buttons. That just gives you an idea of the technique is what I, why I was presenting the buttons, but they actually call these cookies.
one of these buttons is not Bakelite. And I don't, I don't know whether I should challenge you or not to find it, <laughs> but I'll tell you at the end, okay? But I wanted you to notice um, a cherry and bacon and butterscotch button at the top. This one. Okay, so it's a quadrifoil. It's like a, a, a cane, is that what they call it? A cane of Bakelite that's uh, butterscotch. And it's wrapped in this uh, transparent cherry and made into a button. I'm gonna quickly also note, the cr this is the crazing I was talking about. Sometimes Bakelite can craze, and this one's badly crazed. Okay, so back to the other button. What if it was on its side and it was cut? Like a bake, uh, like a icebox cookie, and then you'd have this. Or what if it was shaped into a spindle shape put inside of black Bakelite? I know it has a greenish glow, but it's actually black. And cut on its side and holes drilled through it, but that quadrifoil is on the side. I think that's how they do some of these configurations. Okay, now which one was not Bakelite? It was the one on the upper right that is kind of yellowish clear, like green. Was, it's celluloid. It's in the upper right, red and red and yellow. Looks a little greenish even. Oh, okay. Yeah, that one's celluloid. It's a, called a celluloid wafer, but it's made in a cookie technique. Here's this beautiful cookie, perfect but I'd like to discuss the shank on the button. It's a screw and shank. This one qu didn't quite make it all the way in, <laughs> but it gives you an idea of how the shanks were made. Here's the back of another type of Bakelite coat button. And this one is, it has a curved self shank. The only way you can sew these in is with like this um, upholstery needle that's curved. Right. Very difficult. Someone asked me in a previous Bakelite presentation that I gave, are Bakelite buttons ever self shanked? Well, here's a cookie button turned on its side and cut out on, on the side also. And I guess the hole was drilled right through. So yeah, occasionally they are self shanks. Now we're gonna get into some of the garments. This is a homemade two piece ensemble. It has a lovely border print, piped edges and possibly handmade buttonholes. It's remained in perfect condition. The uh, bold colors make it a striking contrast. You see the Bakelite um, mm -hmm. ball buttons that were very, very popular. And the piping, look how beautiful it is. How many of you had a dress like this? Except for our gentleman in the audience. <laughs> he probably never had a dress like this. <laughs> Those are handmade buttonholes. Are they? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, I'll zoom in again. Yeah. I wasn't sure. It was very difficult to find on the internet garments that still have Bakelite on them. Textile designer Ruth Reeves worked for W and J Sloan Company circa 1930s. The title of the fabric is Playboy. I got this uh, picture from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. How cool is that? Bold graphics displayed on a simple sheath dress. 
The motif is cards, chess, a, a chess knight, an equestrian, tennis player, skiing. On the back of the dress is fencing. The dress features a single pocket and a mandarin collar and probably made of linen with the vibrant colors of navy, red, lime, green, accented with butterscotch bakelite close to the neckline, which has me kind of curious that they didn't match anything that they would put butterscotch in there, but okay. <laughs> On the left is a mouton. That's the name of the coat. I have a mouton in my closet. They were very popular in the 1950s. Mouton is a, a lamb's fur that is treated to imitate seal or beaver. I and had one of those. <laughs> my I had, you I do? had a mouton. <laughs> you, does, do you have buttons on yours? No, I don't still have it, and I don't think I had buttons on it. Yeah, mine doesn't have buttons. Mine has hooks. But what I love about it is the warmest coat I have, and that collar, you can pull it up, and it, it would cover the back of your head and your neck and protect you from the wind. And that button uh, that is a quadrifoil uh, with lucite is the actual button that's on that Mouton. Okay, on the right is a faux fur coat. It's very matted. That's how I could tell. And it has a uh, Bakelite uh, buttons uh, with lucite insets or inlays. Let's take a look. See how matted it is? And a real fur wouldn't do that. And that's lucite. Lucite scratches very easily. Okay, did I accidentally, I'm gonna go back. Oh, what have I done? What have I done? Go I, back, go up to slideshow. Yeah, but I have this thing on the top of my uh, thing won't let me. Uh, there we go. Okay, I'm going to fix it. There I you promise. go. That should do it. I'm sorry, guys. No worries. Something I must have hit wrong. High tech. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I want to put this back in presenter view. Okay. I'm happy now. <laughs> Notice there's no buttonholes in fur coats. They were toggled in. I found a similar fur coat online called a cocoon, which was actually tight at the mid calf. And that coat had Bakelite buttons also. So I don't know, we want, want me to zoom in on some of these? These are Bakelite buttons with Lucite inside of them. Susie, what, what do you mean by toggle? Okay, here we go. Do you see that, that uh, piece of um, cording? That cording wraps around the button. No buttonhole. There's a, there's a cord that wraps around the back of that button. That's a toggle. I see, thank you. Okay. For some reason, it won't go forward. There we go. Here's some very fancy coat buttons. 
The one um, on the top is possibly a fuchsia. Some people call it a rosebud. Some people call it a fuchsia and I'm gonna let you decide. The one on the lower right is Art Nouveau and her eyelids are dreamy. Her lips are ready for a kiss. I don't know why it forwarded. It's very strange. I'm trying to go back, but it's okay. The center is cork. The upper right imitates star sapphire. And I'm supposed to say, yikes, where did that bug come in? And he has brass ball chain. His decorative finish, decorative finishes on some of these buttons, not these in particular, but other buttons are gal galena and coralline and metal discs. These are re realistics and multiples. What surprises me is I didn't know that there were elephants um, in Snow White. <laughs> See the flower there? I have all the colors of that flower they made. It has an unusual peg shank. There's got to be a reason I can't forward. Okay, these gentlemen are very small. They're hand painted, kind of folk art. Each one has a different expression. They could be Martha sleepers. The screws represent men's work, but I don't think so. They were probably worn by Rosie the Riveter on her days off. And I love the graphics on the Hollywood card. <laughs> Notice the director with the camera and the megaphone. Notice how all the O's are buttons. And there you have a searchlight that was often used at Hollywood premieres or any premiere, I guess. These are Art Deco laminated. I love the geometric um, shapes and they're very puzzle-like. This octagon features alternating triangles of apple juice and licorice with a circle in the center. This button is mine. It has double shank. Um, it's chocolate and it is laminated with apple juice embedded with stardust. Very heavy button. Now you probably, how many of you know Martha Sleeper or even knew what I meant? Huh? Audience, do you know who Martha Sleeper was? Nope. She was a silent screen actress. I'm old, but not that old. <laughs> <laughs> Martha manufactured novelty jewelry and buttons. They were so popular. She, she produced a catalog of her creations. She lived from 1910 to 1983. Later in life, she moved to Puerto Rico. She gave up making jewelry and buttons altogether and started a clothing line, and she passed away in Puerto Rico. Um, her buttons were very whimsical. Today, they go for a lot of money. Um, they were all hand painted. Um, she did a lot of matchsticks. The uh, little guy on the bottom kind of reminds me of my dad going to a Shriners meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll move on.
sizzling hot news, Martha Sleeper jumps into spring jewelry with spicy hot pickles. Well, she doesn't say hot. <laughs> Kings and queens, sunfish and dollies? Doilies. Doilies? Doilies? The time has come, Martha Sleeper says, to speak of pickles. Alice in Wonderland, Majesty's Fish and Doilies? She expressed herself eloquently in the sensational jewelry at the Boston store. How many of you remember the Boston store? <laughs> no? Andy Warhol collected Martha Sleeper. Wow. <laughs> Bakelite also came in figural sets. They were die cut and pressed vegetables, fruit, uh, Snow White, but there were only two, two dwarfs that were ever made. Um, the Scotty dog here is, oh, President Roosevelt had a dog named, does, does anybody remember the name of the President Roosevelt's dog? It'll come to you. <laughs> And there were lots of nursery rhymes, obviously. The Fala or? Yeah, Fala, correct. There were a lot of buttons made and probably jewelry because of uh, Roosevelt's dog. There's some realistic shapes and I'm supposed to say, oh, look, there's a fish. I think that was an artichoke. Okay, here's a few more realistic shapes made of Bakelite. The buttons, well, the clothespin and the iron represent woman's work. But if you were to have that iron on your garment, you would have to bring the needle from behind on the backside of the fabric, knot it on the backside and bring the needle up, and then you'd have to turn the needle under the handle and go down on the other side of the handle. This, is, this would be a pain to sew that button in. I don't know how many of you agree. <laughs> and again, yikes, here's another critter. He's a creepy crawler and he has plastic cording legs. This is to show you fun shapes that Bakelite came in, some very Art Deco ones. Um, that's not necessarily schmutz, that could be oxidation. More fun shapes. And I want you to notice my necklace at the end. Okay, you will see on the top there is apple juice with licorice made in a cookie format. It's the same button showing you from the side and from the top. And then, oh. yeah, isn't that something? Yeah. I wish I had that button someday. And then there's the apple juice ones that are banded and they are cut on the face of the button. This is an apple juice button embedded with stardust and root beer is laminated on the top, which brings some more laminated buttons. Now these buttons look different. These are called British Butterscotch Bakelite, made in England. Jocelyn Howells, she lives in Oregon, is given credit for naming this material. She studies buttons and materials and she has authored, authored, authored two books that I constantly use as reference guides. They are, these buttons are in very high relief. Um, and I'll talk about British Butterscotch Bakelite on the next slide. Manufactured in England, 
between 1946 to 1960, the resin is orange and usually can be seen where it is worn off on the back. The buttons are molded and the back shows saw marks and knife marks or file marks. Sometimes they have bubbles on the surface. Let's take a closer look. Even a little schmutz. <laughs> That's the back of British Butterscotch Bakelite. Here's some uh, resource books that I got at the library in Roseburg. I don't know if you guys like to do screenshots or just go to the library and look up Bakelite and you'll learn more about the colors and the products that were made. And we're close to the end. Um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation, but I have a special treat for you. Um, so don't go away. This is Dr. Leach's Bakelite Gallery. He's wow. associated with the Art Deco Society of New York. And I'm going to slowly scan through this gallery so that you can see the bangles, the pins, the necklaces. I'm sure there's a lot of Martha sleepers in there. Clocks, knickknacks. What, what do I, what's the Yiddish word for knickknacks? Chachke. Jotchkas, yes, things you have to dust. <laughs> yes. And of course, dice, clocks and radios. Oh. And where to purchase Bakelite pads, those little testing pads I was talking about. They're called polishing pads. You can buy them on Etsy, Amazon, CNB Wiser is a button supplier. Button Images is also a button supplier. And Rio Grande, I think maybe a bead, bead supplier. And these are possibly white. Bakelite, which would be very, very rare because white was supposed to oxidize into a cream color. So they might be reproductions. I have no idea. And I am done with my program. Now, I hope you made notes of any particular uh, slide you have a question on, and I'll answer your questions at the end. Susie, thank you. That was lovely. Did some people bring um, artifacts from cupboards and drawers? This might be a good time to share them if you did. Nobody went through their cupboards and drawers, huh? <laughs> well, I'm, gonna, my, I'm, gonna go look, I'm gonna go look in my button box because I've got lots of those and I'm so happy to hear your stories. I'm gonna go get mine now. Okay, I'm gonna show you um, what I made. This I made is totally random. This is totally random, okay? Um, I added one of my extra daisy buttons. Bakelite's kind of pricey. All these buttons, I did not buy these buttons outright. These ball buttons are found at the bottom of button boxes. And as I found them, I added them to this little ribbon. I'm gonna take this off and show it you. It looks like it would be very heavy. It is. It? Oh, this is my new camera. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. And it also tells you the colors the butterscotch, the cherry, the licorice. I only have one or two on there that are um, apple juice. 
So it kind of gives you an idea what, what were the popular colors of the time. Hi, this is Sabina. I'm going to try to, I've got a box yeah. of these. So I've just never known. Okay, can you see this one? Oh. Oh, very oh, Art Deco. Yeah. 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 This. We don't know if that's. Can you spotlight her? Okay. It's like, obviously it's, and look at the sparkle. Is it a transparent? Yeah, it looks like that applesauce you said. And then apple, apple juice. Apple, apple juice. juice. On. Yeah. Butterscotch. Butterscotch. Oh my God, I learned so much from you today. Look at this one. I had no idea. I've been saving these forever. I've got some okay. from my dad's jacket from his old oh, apple juice. Oh my God, this. Uh, there's. I sorted these by color, unfortunately, instead of by Bakelite, but. Here's another button, if you can see. Okay, turn it over. I want to see the shank on the back. Can you spotlight her? Can she be spotlighted? Oh. Yeah, if it speaks, I mean, if you speak. All right, here's, here's my. Okay, that one's, that one is not Bakelite. It's vegetable ivory. It's made oh, from Oh, okay, okay. It's made from a nut. <laughs> oh my God. All right, so let me see what else. I've got, a, oh, I've got so many of these, but I just, okay. What's that? What's uh, my first guess is casein, but I don't know for sure. Okay, okay. Casein was a milk product. Oh, interesting. How about this one? Ooh. <laughs> I'm not sure. I know. <laughs> None of us are. Um, okay. Even though I've been collecting for 15 years, I still have a box of buttons that I can't figure out. Oh. And of all the collectors I've talked to, they all have boxes of buttons that they can't figure out that will remain oh, mystery. Man. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, okay. Look at this one. What's that? Oh. Mm. That's very cool. That interesting design that you like you were showing it's, earlier. It looks Art Deco, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, looks like Ella is holding a button too. Yeah, I found a button. Uh, I, I was looking for my button box and I uh, hopefully it doesn't have buttons in it, so I don't know where they went. <laughs> One thing I can tell you about Bakelite, it will not have a knockoff mark in the back. What I mean by knockoff mark is that little tiny circle that you'll see usually in the center of the back of a button. That's from injection molding. Bakelite mm -hmm. and um, casein, the milk product, do not have those knockoff marks. Neither does celluloid, okay? The modern plastics have a knockoff mark. Does that make it easier for you to identify? Okay, how about this? So, okay, Sabine is holding something, and so is Ellen. So, could you spot my so pile of buttons? Can I get oh, Sabina, if you speak while you're holding it up. All right. So this has this this is metal of some sort on the back. That looks and like, embedded. You know what it looks like? What shoe clips? Um, Maybe enamel know. on the front. It's like copper enamel. Copper enamel. They're mm -hmm. enamel. Ah. Oh. But also, I think that might be Bakelite. Oh dear, there's so many. So okay, okay, off, here's one you? for real. Yeah, that's Bakelite. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So cool. Yeah. Little treasures. <laughs> oh, no, I just found one that's got that glazing. Okay, how about this? How about that one? Show me the back. Hmm. Okay, that's the celluloid. And oh, it's a hollow celluloid buff button. Wow. Oops. Very collectible. Very collectible. Oh, Actually, in two days, I'm giving a presentation on that type of button. So. How about this one? Okay. That might be considered trim, not a button. I'm not sure, but it looks like apple juice. It's got a, a wire going through the top of it. That's about a million years old. Yeah. I, if it was not made to go through a buttonhole, it's not a button. So you have to think about that. Okay. It could be trim. How about, how about this one? 
I know what that is. What is that it? It was made by Le Chic, and it's called Lava Horn. And it's made for suits. Uh huh. Coats. Lava Horn. And by this? Le this, I'm sure, came off of one of my dad's things. Probably vegetable ivory. Okay. Now, wasn't wasn't another lady there have something she wanted to show? Yeah, oh, I had a bunch of I have a bunch of them, but I'm not really sure that they're bakelite. In fact, I think they're probably not. Well, go by the colors. Go by butterscotch or yeah, I'm not. I don't think they are, but I do think uh, maybe I, my mahjong set is made of bakelite. Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. What about this thing? Okay, that's celluloid extruded. Oh my God, you're such an amazing resource. Amazing. I've been doing it, been doing it for 15 years. <laughs> so, so your suggestion is that I get this, this piece of thing that you can rub on it to find out? Um, you're talking about the, the Bakelite test pads? Yes. If you'd like to know if, what's Bakelite and what is not, mm -hmm. yes. Okay, this is a belt buckle. And this piece of metal is bent around it. But the rest of it is, can't tell what it is, huh? Yeah, no. You need to get the test cloth. All right, I might have to get the test cloth now that I know. Because <laughs> I have a whole box of these. I buy them on Etsy. <laughs> and this one, too. Now that looks like Bakelite, just by the fun shape. Yeah, and the clasp. Which oh, is it's a half of a clasp. Yeah. Uh, that chocolate Bakelite, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Wow. OK, well, now you've inspired me. Anybody else have questions? OK, I'm going to stop. Thank you. I, I have a question, couple questions. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, can you hear me? Yes. OK, uh, do you do these presentations in person? So I've been doing them Zoom ever since the pandemic. Okay. You know, but I mean, it, yes, it, but ha, ha, in the future, do you, I mean, if things go well, I mean, do you think maybe? And the other question is, uh, I hope you come to our, we hope we're all well and things are good and maybe we'll have the, uh, we're planning on a gathering in July and we could see you and talk to you again about it. I think I had tons of that stuff, but I got rid of a lot of stuff. So I have to go look now. But, oh my gosh, it was so interesting. I, going back to my, my husband's grandmother and mother and their jewelry, and I had a huge box of buttons. I'll have to go look at what I have left. And thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Susie, thank you so much. And you know, that is a swell idea. We have a barbecue, a membership luncheon planned for the 10th of July. And if you wanted to bring some of those things to share, I'm sure you'd have a very uh, interested audience. I want to also let you know that in August on the 14th, we'll be hosting a babka making class in real life real humankind in the uh, kitchen at TBI. So we're dipping our toes into being together again and so looking forward to it. Again, Susie, thank you so much for your generosity and sharing your knowledge and, uh, and your love. It's contagious. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think, you. did Judith have another question? She's muted, but she, she was kind of had her hand up. Oh, no, no, no. I was I, just saying goodbye. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Susie. <laughs> Very interesting. A wealth of information. I'm glad you enjoyed it, Alan. Thank you all for joining us today. Again, I'm going to post it on TBI's YouTube channel so you can share that with friends and view it and review it at your convenience. Thanks again for joining us today. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.